<laughs> and we are back today uh, with chapter two now. Hopefully you did all the exercises after chapter one and I'm sure you found them not difficult at all. So let us move on to chapter two. This chapter deals a lot more with atomic structure um, and also atomic theory and it really zeroes in on what is going on at the level of the atom. And it is very important to know this in order to understand how and why atoms, different atoms behave the way they do, different elements behave the way they do, uh, which will take us into bonding. Why do some elements bond with some other ones and these guys bond with something else? So this will be very kind of important groundwork for when we talk about bonding in the next chapter. Okay, so let us begin with Mr. John Dalton. Here he is, the handsome devil, and he is the father of modern atomic theory. And he basically came up with these um, general guidelines, and these have been in practice ever since, slightly revised and so on. But the atomic theory states that all matter is made up of atoms, which is, remember, comes from the Greek word for the smallest piece of something. And all atoms of element, they have the same weight, about the same weight. So an element is an element, is one kind of element, and a different element is completely a different kind of atom. And atoms cannot be created or destroyed. This is also debatable once we get into nuclear chemistry, but let's not talk about that yet. And atoms combine in simple ratios to form compounds. Once again, we have the law, the, the law of definite proportions. So um, H2O is always two hydrogens and one oxygen. Carbon dioxide is always one carbon and two oxygen. And finally, chemical reactions. In chemical reactions, atoms combine, separate, and rearrange. However, they themselves do not fall apart. Unless, of course, it's nuclear. But we're not mentioning that yet. Okay, so let us go on. So Mr. Electron, the electron, um, the smallest particle um, of the three subatomic particles, is the first, was the first subatomic particle to be discovered. And Mr. J.J. Thompson, um, who I believe was an Englishman, he had a great experiment with a cathode ray in which he not only uh, was able to um, discover the electron, but he was also able to pinpoint the electron's charge to mass ratio. This is very, very important um, groundbreaking work um, at that point in time. So a cathode ray, what is it? Let's take a look. Basically, this is a little picture of one. Um, it is a ray made out of glass, um, a tube, with a high potential difference between the two ends. So here's the negative end and here's the positive end. And of course, electrons, um, they will flow away, since they're negative, away from the negative and toward the positive. Also, Mr. J.J. Thompson put in a magnetic field, which as you know, magnetic fields, they exert forces on any moving charge. If a charge is simply still, there will not be a force. But since the electrons were moving, there was a force. So since there was a force, there's a bending of the electron, of the electron um, line. And with that, he could discover what is the charge to mass ratio. Um, you don't necessarily need to know how, although it is pretty interesting if you want to Wikipedia it. Um, but that is what J.J. Thompson did. Then Robert Millikan, um, he took the work of J.J. Thompson and he went a little bit further. What he did, he's famous for the famous oil drop experiment. And by the way, these names that I'm mentioning, even though it seems a little bit like a history lesson, they're still important.